Good morning. Technical glitches solved. Room change made. Many of you went next door, which uh, which was which was fine. It was a very very wonderful thirty seat uh, uh, conference center, and then we started getting the RSVPs in, and we realized we were going to need a bigger room, and so we made lots of last minute adjustments uh, this week, and they moved us. This is actually not a bigger room, but it certainly has more seats in it. So thank you for bearing with us this morning. Uh, my name is David Staley. I'm on uh, faculty in the History Department, and I'm director of the Goldberg Center in the History Department, which is the institutional home for the CLIO Society. Uh, if this is a return visit for you, the CLIO Society, welcome back. Very happy to have you back. If this is your first time at the CLIO Society event, let me uh, briefly introduce uh, what we do with the CLIO Society. Uh, we were formed a little over two years ago. Uh, the goals of, of the CLIA Society to promote the lifelong learning of history for personal enrichment, engaging with students and colleagues and friends and alumni especially, in the exchange of information and ideas about history outside the realm of traditional academic classes and seminars, and to build a network of student colleagues, friends, alumni who are interested in history. We maintain a website, clio.osu.edu, clio.osu.edu, that among other things contains videos of previous CLIO Society events, and that's what we're doing here, we're taping, uh, we're recording this as well, uh, for, uh, for uh, streaming on our website. So I encourage you to go to the website and enjoy these uh, other uh, talks as well. The motto of the CLIO Society is, if you liked history as an undergrad, then you're going to love it now. <laughs> which, is, which is an outstanding tagline, and in fact was the invention of one of our alumni, Dr. Stephen Millett, who's with us today, he's going to say a few words about the Clear Society and other sorts of events. Yes. Thank you, David. Thanks for coming. Uh, snowy morning. You know, some people like Saturday mornings, and some people don't like Saturday mornings, uh, going out that is. But thank you for coming, and you are proof of our proposition that uh, learning really is a lifelong activity, and I'm very gratified that we got a good chuckle from uh, our tagline. But the truth is, a lot of people don't fully appreciate history until they've gotten a little history of their own. And so um, this is an opportunity for us to come back, continue learning, but learning, let's say, in a, a non-traditional way, at least uh, for academia. This is an outreach program. I want to thank David uh, because uh, the Goldberg Center has enthusiastically supported us. Peter. Uh, chair has uh, been very enthusiastic. We've gotten great support from the faculty, alums, friends. I mean, this is a, a wide open. Um, thank you again, and I want to make special acknowledgement of uh, Craig Zimfer. Uh, Craig? Craig? He's the doorman. He's the doorman. <laughs> <laughs> Who's been a very generous uh, donor and helped us uh, cover many of our expenses. So thank you very much for coming this morning. Thank you, Steve. Um, ordinarily, at our CLIA Society events, the chair of the history department uh, serves as MC and introduces the speaker. Uh, but this morning, the chair of the history department is the speaker, which is why I'm uh, substituting for him today as a master of ceremonies. So in addition to serving as chair of the history department since 2006, I believe, uh, Professor Peter Hahn is a specialist in US foreign relations in the Middle East since 1940. He received his bachelor's from Ohio Wesleyan University, just up the road here, his master's and PhD from Vanderbilt University. Since 2002, Peter has served as the executive director of Schaefer, which is the Society of Historians of uh, American Foreign Relations, which is the leading professional society for diplomatic historians, a society of about 1,600 members from about four dozen countries around the world. In 2010, Governor Ted Strickland appointed Professor Hahn to a five-year term on the State of Ohio's War of 1812 Bicentennial Commission. Peter has written a number of books, including the Historical Dictionary of U.S.-Middle East Relations, Crisis and Crossfire, the United States and the Middle East since 1945, Caught in the Middle East, <coughs> U.S. Policy Toward the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 
Empire and Revolution, the United States and the Third World since 1945. And his most recent publication is Missions, I have to say it's right, Missions Accomplished? Question mark. The United States in Iraq since World War I, which of course is the subject of his talk here this morning. And as I hope this introduction indicates to you, Peter is, I think, the very model of that dying breed, the scholar administrator. And we are delighted to have him here this morning. Please join me in welcoming Peter Hahn. Good morning, everyone. And again, thank you for coming out. I'm uh, always delighted to have an opportunity to talk about my research and to forget the administrative half of what I do for a little while. Um, I was pl very pleased from when the Plato Society leaders asked me to give a talk like this on a snowy Saturday morning, and so here we are. And they invited me to base this talk on the book that came out about a year ago, which is uh, prominently displayed here in front of you, which they made allusion to. The book is a seven-chapter survey of the century-long, nearly century-long relationship between the U.S. and Iraq. Um, Iraq emerged from the ruins of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I, officially gaining uh, national identity in 1921, gaining semi-independence from the British Empire in 1932, and down to the modern day, uh, a long-term relationship between the U.S. and Iraq continues to unfold. Uh, I thought I would base today's talk largely on the book, surveying um, the century-long relationship and emphasizing three themes in particular. Um, first, that the U.S. became increasingly involved in Iraq over the century or so of Iraq's existence. No great surprise there, the U.S. became increasingly involved all over the world as it rose to superpower status during and immediately after World War II. In Iraq, there was no exception to that general trend, although it became more involved in Iraq in the last couple of decades than it did a lot of other places around the globe. Secondly, that involvement evolved through several distinct phases. Prior to World War II, U.S. involvement was unofficial, meaning that the government, the federal government, was not really involved, didn't really have a policy toward Iraq, but tended to yield to the British to govern that part of the world. Uh, there was American involvement of cultural and financial varieties prior to World War II, but official involvement wouldn't start until the Second World War. At first, that, that official involvement was political. Uh, for several decades, the U.S. has actively involved diplomatically, and then since uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s, the involvement has had a very heavy military flavor, and I'll try to show you how that in involvement evolved over many decades. The third theme, which I try to drive home in the book, and this speaks to the title that Dr. Staley alluded to, Missions Accomplished, question mark, is that success, however success was defined, proved to be very elusive. In other words, on some occasions, American policies failed dramatically. <coughs> on some occasions, American policies seemed to succeed to a certain degree. But even when success could be claimed, success proved fleeting because circumstances would change, the march of time would go on, Iraq would continue to develop, or there'd be surprises or changes in the international order. And in fact, one of the lessons of studying diplomatic history is that success is generally always fleeting. The world is a very dynamic place, constantly changing and shifting. Oftentimes, policymakers have to settle for sort of muddling through and averting catastrophe and cleaning up the mess. Uh, choosing between the lesser of various evils, not really having a good choice. There's a lot of that that goes on in Iraq as well. Um, that doesn't mean that scholars can abscond from their duty of making evaluations, and I will make evaluations on the wisdom or frivolity of American policy at different stages, but it does recognize that the world is a difficult and dangerous and messy place, and that often success is short-lived. With regard to a broad overview, and here I actually have a little handout, and there might not be enough for everybody. You might have to share, but let me just pass these around. If you want to have a little roadmap of where we go through the next 45 minutes or so, um, I've broken down the long-term, century-long uh, relationship between the two countries into several phases, which I will touch upon in due course. Uh, they're on the green sheet that's coming around. They're here on the screen as well. I'm not going to belabor, belabor them now, since I'll be touching on each one except to say that I'll move fairly quickly through the early phases, as the book does, and as I think is proper because during the early phases the relationship was distant. The U.S. did not consider Iraq an important part of the world. It paid it attention, but not that much attention. 
And so I think it's fair in, to keep things in perspective to move through those decades fairly quickly and then to begin to bring the focus in a little closer in the 1980s and 1990s when Iraq emerged as a major bone of contention and a major challenge for American policymakers. First, with regard to the pre-1945 period, the pre-World War II period, as I said, there was no official involvement in Iraq prior to World War II. It emerged from the Ottoman Empire as an element of the, of the British Empire, as a British mandate under League of Nations authority. The U.S. government was emerging as a superpower and was beginning to flex its muscles in certain parts of the world, like Latin America and Western Europe. But the Middle East was a far-off land where the U.S. government really had practically nothing to say and nothing to do. It just sort of figured the British would take care of that for us here in the West in a general way. That said, there was not official involvement in Iraq, going back for a long time, actually. In fact, we can now document the presence of American missionaries, Presbyterian missionaries, in what was then called Mesopotamia, part of the Ottoman Empire as early as 1829. And in fact, the 19th century was the high watermark of American missionary activity all across the Middle East. By 1900, uh, there were something like um, 400 schools and colleges and nine hospitals and literally thousands of churches dotting the landscape of the Middle East, all the product of a very fervent evangelical movement Amer among American Protestants especially, but also Catholics all through the 19th century. And Americans were at the vanguard of that movement. Uh, the Brits were there as well. The Americans were at the vanguard of it, but that was all done kind of beyond the purview of the state, beyond the purview of wide swaths of public opinion. In the early 20th century, there was a financial interest pursued by the so-called oilmen, meaning the <coughs> businessmen who represented oil firm and the pro firms and the prospectors and engineers who realized that the Middle East was rich in petroleum and that petroleum would have increasing value as the 20th century unfolded. Uh, the first realization that petroleum was especially valuable came when the militaries of the Western world converted from coal to oil as the means of powering their ships uh, during the 1910s, and then after World War I, as the American people adopted what we now call the consumer economy and began driving automobiles everywhere, <coughs> the future of oil looked very golden. There were huge financial incentives to get deeply involved in the Middle East. And so the businessmen, the oil men, led the way. Again, the U.S. government largely stayed out of it, but it was supportive to the extent that it could of the oil companies finding oil fields, gaining access to oil resources in the Middle East, bringing the oil out of the ground, refining it, and getting it to market. The first official U.S. government involvement in Iraq that I've been able to determine was actually a covert intervention by the U.S. ambassador, a guy named Paul Nabinshu, happened to come from Toledo, Ohio, by the way. <coughs> Ambassador Nabinshu was on duty in Iraq from the mid-1930s through 1942, when he died of a tetanus infection, of all things. In 1941, he was watching anxiously as politicians within Iraq were battling for control of the government and uh, trying to shape the relationship of Iraq with the powers fighting World War II. There was a monarchy in Iraq, uh, Here's actually a picture of the monarch, believe it or not. They had a boy king. This young man, King Faisal II, became king in 1939 at age three. Here's a picture of him at age six in 1942. Until he became an adult, power was uh, held by his uncle, who had the title of the regent, the regent of the king. And so they're sort of an acting king until this guy grew up. The regent was pro-British and was trying to hold on to power to keep Iraq kind of in the Allied camp during World War II. Well, there was a fiery nationalist politician named Rashid al Ghalani who wanted to kick out the British, and by way of kicking out the British, he began to partner with the Nazis. He began to welcome Germans into Baghdad, and there was talk of German language radio and a Berlin to Baghdad railway line and so forth. At a decisive moment in the spring of 1941, al Ghalani overthrew the monarchy, meaning he declared that he was now in charge and the monarchy was uh, out of business, uh, there was rioting in the streets, demos in the streets. The regent showed up at the American embassy wearing disguise because he was afraid of being recognized. He talked to Ambassador Nabinshu, who the next morning put him in the back seat of his car 
had him laid out on the floor, covered him with some blankets, armed him with a pistol, and then drove him 100 miles to a British air base, going through several checkpoints along the way, talking his way through. He had the American flag flying on the front of his limo. Uh, he talked his way through checkpoints where they were searching cars, claiming diplomatic immunity. The rebellious army soldiers waved him through. He delivered the regent to the British air base. Within days, British troops came in and crushed the rebellion and put the monarch back in power and the monarchy would survive for another 15 or so years until 1958. So even at the height of World War II, because of the national security dynamics at play here, the American ambassador intervened covertly to help reverse a pro-German revolution and put a pro-British government back in power. Phase two, 1945 changes everything. With the end of the Second World War, the emergence of the US as one of the world's two superpowers, engaged in Cold War struggle against the Soviet Union. In a nutshell, the Cold War was a decades-long struggle, as I'm sure you all know, between the American uh, alliance and the Soviet alliance for political mastery and military control of the world. The U.S. policy, generally speaking, in the Cold War was to contain Soviet influence, to hem in communism within the current borders of the Soviet Union, until it died a natural death of internal causes at some point in the future. A key part of the Cold War was the negotiation of defense alliances that would ring in the Soviet Union. You've probably heard of the NATO alliance, which linked the powers of Western Europe with the US and Canada. You might have even heard of CHO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, which was a mutual defense pact between the US and various countries in South and East Asia. Well, a key part of the overall global strategy was to fill in the gap between NATO and CATO. That was done in 1955 with the so-called Baghdad Pact, officially called the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO. The Baghdad Pact was in a, a defense alliance linking four states in the Middle East and South Asia, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, together with the United Kingdom as the Western anchor. The U.S. never officially joined for complicated reasons. I won't... Uh, uh, trouble you with now, but suffice it to say the U.S. was informally a member and was as good as a member. It gave the Baghdad Pact money. It promised that if it got into a scrap, of course, American troops and American even nuclear weapons would be used and so forth and so on. The Baghdad Pact was negotiated with the royalist government of Iraq, still hanging on to power, the pro-British monarchy of Iraq, very much in the Western camp. And this was seen as a, uh, a very important global component in the Cold War struggle, containing the Soviets and winning the Cold War for the West. Now, time would quickly tell that the Baghdad Pact was based on a very weak foundation. By that I mean that the monarchy continued to become unpopular in the eyes of the people of the streets of Iraq because, number one, it was a monarchy and it was corrupt and it seemed to deny their domestic aspirations for power and influence and equality. And number two, because it was pro-British. As the 1950s unfolded all over the Third World, and especially in the Middle East, there was an anti-British, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial movement catching on, like wildfire, inspiring peoples all over Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia to cast off their European colonial masters. Iraq was no exception. In the streets of Iraq, the British Empire became very unpopular. The monarchy, which was relying on the British, became unpopular. Finally, in July 1958, a coalition of military officers led by a general named Abdel Karim Qasim overthrew the monarchy and a bloody coup d'etat, murdered members of the royal family, murdered the civilian prime ministers who had served, served them, and declared martial law, declared that they were now in control. The U.S. government thought briefly about intervening in Baghdad in July 1958 to reverse this revolution. The British actually advocated such intervention. Uh, the British Prime Minister, Earl Macmillan, called up Eisenhower and said, let's go. And let me give you a little context here. There were also rebellions going on in Lebanon and potentially a rebellion in Jordan. In Lebanon and Jordan, the Anglo-Americans did intervene. U.S. Marines went into Lebanon. British soldiers and some American airplanes went into Jordan to prevent a revolution there. They thought about doing that in Iraq. Macmillan wanted to do it, but Eisenhower said no. That's just a little too far away. It would reach beyond what the American people would tolerate. It's too risky of an operation. We don't have as much at stake there. He did put on the brakes and avoid intervening in that case. And so the revolution went forward. 
that opened what I call a phase of chronic instability um, in Iraq and in the U.S.-Iraqi relationship, a period that ran from 1958 to 1979. The monarchy, obviously, was not a democratic government, not a picture-perfect government, but the regimes that followed it had problems of their own. Uh, they tended to be military dictatorships, not democracies. They tended to be suppressive of their own peoples, including potential rivals who were put to death or assassinated, and they tended to be unstable. In fact, this period of Iraq had a wave of revolutions. There were coups d'etat in 1958, one I've already talked about, another in 1963, another in 1968, and finally another in 1979. And if that weren't enough instability, in between each of these coups, it was a constant story of assassinations, assassination attempts, attempted coups, palace intrigue, you name it, it was just constantly sort of politically a mess. No one was quite sure how long the current government would stay in place, and everyone seemed to be plotting at trying to grab his share of power. During this time, the U.S. tried from somewhat of a distance to establish a, a stable relationship with Iraq. I can't say the U.S. wanted to become friends. In fact, the U.S. didn't think Iraq was all that important. It had other fish to fry elsewhere in the world. But State Department officials did what they could to try to stabilize relations. They did recognize various governments as they came to power. They even, for a while in the 1960s, sent hundreds of millions of dollars in economic aid and some military aid to various regimes to try to become friends, make stable relations with them. They even recommended to oil companies that they be more charitable in the distribution of wealth that they were creating by pulling Iraqi oil out of the ground, and all of that was for the good. And at some points of time, um, a seemingly cooperative relationship between the governments in Washington and Baghdad emerged. By contrast, there are also sources of tension through this period. There was a border crisis involving the Kingdom of Kuwait in 1961, uh, where the British had to send some troops into the region. Again, I don't have time to trouble you with those details, but the U.S. backed the British against Iraq, and some tension resulted. There was also a perpetual conflict over the state of Israel. Iraq had been one of the Arab combatants that had tried to destroy Israel in its infancy in 1948. It was also the only one of those combatants not to sign an armistice in 1949. It simply withdrew its troops from the battlefield, meaning that technically, legally, a state of war continued to exist between Israel and Iraq. And there were ongoing tensions in that relationship including Iraqi involvement in the Six-Day War of 1967, which uh, created this perpetual uh, tension and, and um, persistent tension in the relationship between Washington and Baghdad. Finally, we get to the Nixon era, 1969, Nixon-Ford era, 1969 to 1976. Nixon came in with a very comprehensive policy for sort of remaking America's position in the Middle East, based on a premise he called the Nixon Doctrine, the Nixon Doctrine would be built on two foundations, one in Iran and one in Saudi Arabia. Iraq didn't seem important or strong enough to factor into Nixon's plans, so he pretty much just left it alone. He ignored it and allowed the relationship to begin to deteriorate. Coincidentally, at that very moment, sort of through the 70s, we saw the rise of Saddam Hussein to a very prominent position of power within the Iraqi state. The coup in 1968 had brought to power a guy named Hassan al-Bakr. Al-Bakr quickly identified Saddam Hussein as his number two guy. And one of the reasons why he counted on Saddam Hussein as his number two guy is that Saddam was efficient and ruthless. Ruthless at eliminating political enemies, vicious toward smashing uh, potential rivals, potential dissenters and very efficient at maintaining a crack security unit that protected the security of the regime, that kept other coups from happening. And in fact, Saddam was able to break up the assassination plots and the, uh, and the palace intrigues, so to speak, before they came to fruition. Finally, by 1979, Saddam was in a position to make a bid for power himself. He didn't have Hassan al-Bakr murdered, but he did declare that he'd become so old and ill he was no longer able to maintain power. And so Saddam was now the guy in charge. Do you have a question? No, just a comment. And if, if I have to leave it until later, that's fine. Yeah, um, yeah, why don't we save the comments and questions? So I'll try to move through all of this, and we'll try to have, that's okay, we'll try to play your time for questions and comments at the end. <coughs>
Now, the rise of Saddam leads to the era of the 1980s, which is when the story really becomes dicey and challenging for the U.S. Uh, 1979, as I mentioned, marked the rise of Saddam Hussein to power in the summer, July of 1979. A couple of months before, I'm sure you all recognize this man on the left, the Ayatollah Ruhol of Khomeini had taken power in neighboring Iran. <clears throat> and the simultaneous rise of these two men to positions of power in states that had shared a long legacy of conflict and had potential for lots of conflicts over oil, borders, ideology, uh, identity, and so forth. This was a prescription for trouble to emerge quite quickly. When Khomeini took power in Tehran, he was the head of a very anti-American and very nationalistic rebellion that ousted the Shah. Not only did he consolidate power within Iran by fairly vicious means, violent means, he also preached an ideology of wanting to expand his revolution across the Middle East, of wanting to overthrow corrupt monarchies and corrupt governments across the region and bring his version of conservative Islamic government to the entire Islamic <laughs> world. Well, on his doorstep was Iraq, run by a secular military leader, and behind him was Saudi Arabia, run by a corrupt monarchy, and so all the countries of the region are fearful of uh, Iranian expansionism and begin to see Iraq, and Iraq begins to see itself as the essential bastion, the defensive line against the spread of the Iranian revolution across the region. It didn't take long for tensions to develop between Iran and Iraq. By early 1980, there were a couple of border skirmishes. And then in September 1980, the start of the Iran-Iraq War, and it started with a massive Iraqi invasion of Iran across about an 800-mile front. On this map, everything that's sort of in the dark yellow is Iranian territory that was occupied by the initial Iraqi assault of late 1980. Um, Saddam Hussein calculated that if he launched this kind of attack, it would burnish his reputation as a great Arab statesman and make him a top dog in the neighborhood. He also figured that it might bring down the Khomeini regime. He calculated that the Iranian officer corps, the professional soldiers in Iran, didn't like Khomeini, and that if he attacked, they would become demoralized, and they would turn on Khomeini, and someone would get rid of him. So he actually thought this invasion would trigger the reversal of the Iranian revolution. That was a massive miscalculation. Hussein was a master of making massive miscalculations. It wouldn't be his last. Um, instead, of course, he stimulated patriotism among Iranian soldiers who rallied to the defense of Khomeini's regime and put up a tremendous fight. Saddam also is at a huge tactical disadvantage. His capital is only 100 miles from the border. Tehran is about 425 miles from the border and behind some mountains. Uh, the Iranian people outnumber the Iraqi people three to one. Iran has much greater access to the sea, by which it can keep alive its oil trade and make money and trade and things like that, move supplies around. And it doesn't take long, really, by 1981, 1982, for Iran to launch massive counterattacks that push the Iraqis back out of Iran and now begin to occupy Iraqi territory. And all of a sudden, Saddam is back on its heels, fighting a defensive war on his own terrain. Uh, there's a little bit of blue-green here along the border that actually shows Iraqi territory that was occupied by the Iranians during the counteroffensives of 1982. Now, from that point forward, the war along the front sort of stabilized. There wasn't great fluid movement of troops back and forth, but there was massive killing. Uh, the Ira Iraqis used chemical weapons. The Iranians used teenage boys as human minesweepers. There were massive infantry charges back and forth. Massive amounts of killing. Uh, the best estimates put the total death toll at about one million over eight years of warfare. Uh, that made it one of the most uh, uh, violent and destructive wars of the post-World War II era, and it raged almost for an entire decade. The U.S. government, our, our focus after all today, the U.S. relations with Iraq, the U.S. government in the 1980s was presided over by Ronald Reagan. When he initially took office in 1981, his administration declared a policy of neutrality toward the Iran-Iraq war, meaning we're going to stand to that. We don't really have a dog in this fight. We're going to set this one out. But within a couple of years, Reagan embraced a policy that was called uh, the so-called tilt, the so-called tilt policy, tilting toward Baghdad. 
Reagan and his advisors concluded, to put it succinctly, that they could not risk the calamity that would follow an Iraqi military defeat. As the Iranian army gained ground and as they began to fear that maybe the Iranians would actually win, they calculated that that would be a huge blow to American security interests because Iraq would fall and maybe beyond Iraq, Saudi Arabia would fall and maybe the Iranian revolution would spread and the Ayatollah would be in charge of all the oil, not just Persian oil. That's too much for Americans to bear. Now, Saddam Hussein was no Boy Scout. The American officials didn't like him, so they didn't really want to embrace him and uh, bolster him too much, but they just wanted to lean toward him, tilt toward him. That's why they use the word tilt, not partnership or alliance. They're going to tilt toward Baghdad. They're going to do some minimal things to make sure that Iraq has the ability to keep fighting, that Iraq has the ability to survive. So they begin to send uh, some economic and military aid to Baghdad. They restore diplomatic relations, which had been broken during the Six-Day War in the late 1960s. They begin to share intelligence with Iraqi military officials, telling them where you know satellite photo photographs that reveal where the Iranian army units are congregating so the Iraqis can drop chemical weapons on them and so forth. The Americans condemned the Iraqi use of chemical weapons officially because that was a violation of international law, but then they sort of turned a blind eye and allowed it to happen anyhow. Eventually, most importantly, I think, Reagan agreed to the so-called reflagging of Kuwaiti tankers, meaning that oil tankers registered to Kuwait were reflagged or re-registered as American vessels with the stars and stripes flying on them, and that meant that the U.S. Navy would protect them on the Persian Gulf. That was critical because those Kuwaiti tankers now reflagged with American flags were carrying Iraqi oil to market, and that was Iraq's lifeline in terms of raising money that it needed to pay the bills of war. The reflagging operation meant that the U.S. Navy had to send a fleet into the Persian Gulf to protect these ships, and in fact, in 1986, 1987, 1988, there were combat engagements between the U.S. Navy and the Iranian Navy, which was attacking the Kuwaiti tankers, now reflagged Kuwaiti tankers, and there, was, there were hostilities, there was fighting between the U.S. and Iran on the Gulf in the late 1980s. Finally, the Reagan administration was able to bring the two sides to an armistice agreement via UN offices in 1988, negotiating an armistice that both Iran and Iraq agreed to. Neither one won. Really, the armistice reestablished the status quo antebellum. They called it a draw and went home after eight years of warfare and a million dead. A, a very tragic story. Uh, but they both sort of just became completely fatigued by the war and realized they would never win, and they had to quit because it was bleeding. Both of them white. Just after that war ended, if anyone had hoped that maybe uh, you know the, the violence of the region was spent, it was only beginning, in fact. Um, the aftermath of the Iran-Iraq war left in place conditions that set the stage for the eruption of another war within uh, about 24 months. Uh, what were those conditions? Well, Saddam Hussein ended the war with this broker draw with Iran but convinced that he had been victimized in various ways and that he needed to continue a militant, aggressive foreign policy in order to thrive as a leader. Uh, Saddam faced all kinds of problems at home in the aftermath of the Iran-Iraq war. His treasury had been emptied by the war. He once carried massive surpluses, billions of dollars of surpluses in financial revenue, financial resources because of his oil industry, by the end of the war, he's in debt. All that money's gone. His people are demoralized. His army soldiers are tired and are talking about political change. He um, also sees the end of the Cold War and fears that maybe the Soviets, his traditional patron, aren't going to be there to be generous far into the future. He also thinks that he's been cheated by his Arab neighbors like Kuwait. Kuwait during the 1980s operating all those ships, carrying the oil to market. Well, they made a lot of money, too. And Saddam thought, how unfair is that? All these Iraqis have died <laughs> to stop the Ayatollah, and the Kuwaitis have taken advantage of that situation. War profiteers, they've become filthy rich. They've taken a lot of money. I'm poor. That's unfair. I need to do something about that. <clears throat> Saddam started to talk about uh, gaining oil interests at the expense of his neighbor Kuwait, the Kingdom of Kuwait, a tiny country on the southern frontier. Tensions resulted. The U.S. government, now under George Herbert Walker Bush, 
could see the tensions mounting and try to intervene politically to disperse those tensions, to, to dissipate those tensions. But Saddam seemed intent on remaining aggressive. And in fact, people who write about Saddam say the guy was a uh, megalomaniac. He had violence at his core. It's just the type of vicious person he was. He loved to fight. He loved to try to win things via violence. He was not a nice guy. Uh, so it was just part of his predisposition to settle all issues by mobilizing his army. Um, if he could beat Kuwait, he would gain wealth. He would gain prestige. Everyone in the region would respect him. He'd be the bad boy on the block, you know, and he could walk with a bit of a, a strut. And uh, that was part of his thinking as well. So these tensions led to an invasion of Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990. Kuwait was a tiny country. It didn't have much of an army. It had a lot of money, but it hadn't spent much on arms. It had really no ability to defend itself. Within about 48 hours, Saddam's army swept through Kuwait and conquered it and kicked out its government and declared that Kuwait and its oil wealth were now the 19th province of Iraq. Thank you very much. End <laughs> of story. Um, President Bush watched these events, as did most statesmen around the world, uh, were shocked by the suddenness of the military conquest, and quickly decided that that military conquest is something they could not tolerate. Uh, I think Bush's reasoning, his reaction to the invasion of Kuwait, turned on four factors. Number one, he was afraid of what would happen to Saudi Arabia. If, you know, we, we used to be afraid that Iran was going to take Iraq and then Saudi Arabia. Well, now it's Iraq on the march in that direction. Saddam has oil of his own. Now he's just added control of Kuwaiti oil. What would stop him from doing a Kuwait on Saudi Arabia and grabbing that oil as well? There's nothing there to stop him. The Saudis don't have a military capable of even slowing him down. And if we let that happen, Saddam will have control of two-thirds of the oil of the Middle East. And that's not a scenario we want to think about for very long. Uh, a second problem was that the Invasion, if unchecked, would enable Saddam to consolidate his power and reputation again as the bad boy, as the neighborhood bully, and that would stimulate uh, people to give him loyalty and to pay obeisance to him in a way that seemed destructive to the international order. President Bush, as a man of the World War II generation, also thought a lot about the so-called Munich analogy. That was a lesson drawn from the origins of World War II which essentially said if you let a dictator commit aggression and get away with it, he's going to commit additional aggression. So you've got to nip it in the bud, you've got to stop him early, you've got to meet force with force and turn him back, or you're going to have a much bigger problem on your hands. And then coincidentally, <coughs> as the Cold War came to an end, the Pentagon worked on a new national security doctrine, which was called the uh, informally called the Rogue Doctrine, the Rogue Doctrine was an official policy statement the Pentagon wrote in early 1990 saying that as we move beyond the Cold War, the biggest threat to American national security would be the emergence of rogue states, third world, tin horn dictators who become bullies in their neighborhoods. That was written in March of 1990. Voila, Saddam Hussein proves seemingly that the Rogue Doctrine is valid. The Rogue Doctrine calls for the U.S. government to respond to those dictators with firmness, to keep them in check. Bush thinks this is a tailor-made case to implement the Rogue Doctrine. So his assessment leads him promptly to the conclusion that he has to contest the Iraqi conquest of Kuwait. And that contest goes through three stages, or turns on three key decisions that President Bush made. Number one, he decided promptly in August 1990, as soon as the invasion was consolidated, to launch Operation Desert Shield. Operation Desert Shield involved getting about 100,000 GIs into the deserts of Saudi Arabia and ships on the Persian Gulf to act as a uh, defensive barrier to ensure that the invasion of Kuwait remains in Kuwait. To just you know, make sure Saddam is not tempted to push on into Saudi Arabia. Uh, because if he did, then again, he'd capture all that oil and he'd capture potential American military bases and so forth. The Desert Shield was a line in the sand to ensure that the problem didn't become any bigger. That was followed by Operation Desert Storm, which was a calculated decision to resist the invasion, to try to reverse the invasion with traditional military action. Bush spent the fall of 1990 building the international coalition he would need to pull this off and making sure that the American people and the United Nations were behind a military strike to reverse the aggression. 
Operation Desert Storm was launched in January 1990. It consisted of two phases. Phase one was an air war that lasted about six weeks and which punished mercilessly Iraqi military targets in Kuwait and in Iraq proper. Military bases, supply depots, airfields, communications, intelligence headquarters, government buildings, and so forth. Six weeks of a punishing aerial offensive to disorient to discombobulate the opposition. And then in February of 1991, a four-day, 96-hour ground combat operation of uh, international forces. You can see it was involved U.S., Britain, France, Saudi, Egypt, and even Syria. Even Syria didn't like Saddam Hussein and was ready to fight with the U.S. at that point in time. Uh, a massive ground offensive with the famous hook right that cut in behind Kuwait. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it took 96 hours to liberate Kuwait from Iraqi military control. Now, President Bush's third decision, and one of the most controversial of the whole war, what should he do once he's liberated Baghdad? I'm sorry, once he's liberated Kuwait City? Some of his advisors and some public commenters called on him just to go ahead and march all the way to Baghdad. Why not? You've got Saddam on the ropes, you've got him back on his heels, you have an international army on the forward march, just let them go all the way to Baghdad and solve this problem once and for all. President Bush thought about it, but then some of his advisors said there are good reasons not to. If we do that, it's much riskier. It'll be a much messier and costlier war than the liberation of Kuwait. We'll lose a lot of guys. We'll lose a lot of money. Our international coalition might fracture. The American people might not be supportive. President Bush decided that he would stop, that he would not march to Baghdad when he seemingly had that opportunity. One of the reasons why he decided to stop was that he also calculated he had options. He had the option of dealing with Saddam Hussein by other means, um, and hence he developed this strategy that would continue to the end of his administration, all the way through the Clinton administration, and into the George Bush years, George W. Bush years, his son's years as president, of containing Saddam Hussein. We don't have to take him out, that doesn't mean we have to ignore him and leave him alone. But we can put him in a cage, in the famous words of Secretary of State James Baker, we can put him in a cage and that will keep him confined, it'll keep him contained, and that's a better solution than marching all the way to Baghdad. So not marching to Baghdad didn't mean leave him alone and walk away and call it the day over, but it did mean containing Saddam with a long-term strategy, like had been used against the Soviet Union, pen him up, keep him in a cage, until he dies, until someone overthrows him, until he decides to turn over a new leaf and become nice, um, <laughs> until something happens in the future. It's an indefinite strategy, but it is uh, seemingly a viable option. The containment of Saddam's strategy had several major tactics that were begun in 1991 and lasted right up until the early 2000s. Number one, the sanctions and the political condemnation of Saddam's <coughs> behavior that were implemented by the United Nations during the war were continued for the post-war period. And the UN affirmed in 1991 and 1992 that all the financial and trade restrictions against Saddam remained in force, and they would remain in force until Saddam complied with all UN resolutions, which essentially meant, you know, until he joined the Boy Scouts and became a responsible international statesman. So there was that pressure, financial pressure and political condemnation. Number two, via UN mandate, the U.S. and other powers also engaged in intrusive arms inspections designed to ensure that Saddam would relinquish his capacity in weapons of mass destruction. We knew that Saddam had chemical weapons. He used them against the Iranians. We knew that he had tried to build nuclear bombs all through the 80s. Uh, we feared that he was working on biological agents, and so let's get the U.N backing to go in and investigate intrusively, meaning surprise inspections of military facilities and chemical factories and research labs to make sure that he wasn't working in any of these areas. Step number three was to implement the so-called no-fly zones. There were two of them, one in the north, one in the south. Um, they were oper operationalized by the U.S. military together with the British and French. Operation Northern Watch was the effort in the north, Operation Southern Watch in the south. The idea was that American air power would overfly these regions to ensure, number one, that Saddam did not brutalize his own people, the Kurds of the north and the Shia of the south. Number two, that he did not mass his forces along his neighbor's borders, like he had done with Kuwait 
1990. So he couldn't really threaten Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or Turkey again, because if he put ground troops into those no-fly zones, they'd be taken out by American air power. And uh, Iraqi air power was not allowed to fly in those zones either. So essentially, the US and its allies put up these curtains of defense over significant portions, almost half of the country. And Saddam was told, you can't militarize, you can't put any armed units into those regions. That's a way of keeping him in the cage as well. And then on occasion, the US government launched combat strikes against the Iraqis when they misbehaved, when they tried to deny arms inspections, when they did something wrong. The U.S. would open up with aerial bombardment or cruise missile strikes. There were big strikes in 1991, another in 1993, another major strike in 1998 uh, by Republicans and Democrats, by Bush one and Clinton, when Saddam seemed to test, when he, when he you know, started to pry the bars of the cage apart, <coughs> then you'd whack him with a club and try to force him back in. That's sort of the thinking behind the combat strikes. Saddam Hussein, as time went by, proved to be increasingly effective in resisting the cage, uh, the containment barriers against him. Uh, he was wily, he was creative. As time went by, by the late 1990s, cracks in the containment facade were beginning to emerge. One area of concern, Saddam proved effective at dividing his adversaries, meaning finding a way to drive wedges between the powers arrayed against him. By the year 2000, in fact, countries including France, as well as Russia and China, began to argue with the UN that the time for financial sanctions had come to an end, that they were ineffective, that we should throw in the towel and begin trading with Saddam Hussein again. Hussein also was skillful at winning public opinion, both at home and abroad. At home, he could take the martyr role. Look what they're doing to us, the Iraqi people, and he actually became more popular among his own people, at least among the Sunnis upon whom he relied. He also is effective at turning the blockades of his country against those who implemented them. Uh, you're not going to trade with me. You know what that means? That means here in Baghdad there are children starving to death. And he bring in the news cameras and show how hundreds, thousands of kids starved to death. And he blamed that on the rapacious Western powers that wouldn't sell food and so forth and so on and he began to turn public opinion on the global scale as well. His military also engaged in uh, testing activities that the US uh, combatants there called cheat and retreat, meaning he was constantly probing the borders. He would send his airplanes into the no-fly zones and then race back out, seeing what kind of reaction he could get. He offered a bounty. He told members of his military, anyone who shoots down an American airplane gets an $18,000 cash bonus. And so there were lots of you know, guys who would take a chance. They'd put a battery out there in the no man's land and they would shoot at the American aircraft flying overhead. Uh, they called, the American military would call that cheat and retreat because they would dash into the no-fly zone, dash toward the border, and then dash back, uh, trying all the time to provoke, to get a little firefight going of some kind to test the mettle of the American forces. By the way, operations Northern Watch and Southern Watch, 200,000 flights over 12 years, not a single aircraft brought down. Uh, not for lack of trying, they did shoot, they did send fighters against American and British and French aircraft, but not a single one lost enemy fire over that long time. Then Saddam found a way by December of 1998 to end the arms inspections. He had begun, initially he said, fine, come in and inspect everything. But then as time went by, he began throwing up bureaucratic roadblocks, telling the international inspectors, you can't go to that base, you can't go to this city, delaying their paperwork, not letting their airplanes land, one bureaucratic obstacle over the next. Finally, in December 1998, it got to a point where the arms inspections essentially came to a screeching halt. That was the time when President Clinton ordered the last combat strike retaliation, a massive aerial and missile blitz against Iraqi government targets in Baghdad. <clears throat> but that was ineffective in getting the arms inspections opened anymore after that. So really that important arm of the effort to keep Saddam in the cage, to make sure that he was no longer building weapons of mass destruction, that came to a screeching halt by the end of the 1990s. Late in President Clinton's administration, there began within the U.S. a discussion about maybe changing the policy toward Iraq from containment to what was called regime, regime change. 
regime change meant, according to his advocates, that the containment doctrine we've been following since the end of the Gulf War in 1991 is no longer working. Saddam's rattling the cage. There are cracks in the in the bars. He's finding a corner, you know, where he's trying to stake out. So we need to move more proactively toward getting rid of him, toward regime change, overthrowing him in some way and putting a more friendly government in place. Regime change was advocated by a group of public officials and intellectuals commonly called the neocons, neoconservatives. That's a somewhat imprecise uh, definition or, or description because there were political liberals, there were some Democrats among them, although they tended to be conservative Republicans. They began to advocate in public writings, in testimony at Capitol Hill, by whispering in the ear of Pentagon officials, by writing letters to Bill Clinton, they began to lobby for regime change as the new policy of the U.S. government. President Clinton was reluctant, although he did, in 1998, sign a piece of legislation called the Iraq Liberation Act. The Iraq Liberation Act passed the House and the Senate and got the approval of the Democratic President Bill Clinton. It said that the United States government should move toward a policy of changing the government in Iraq from Saddam Hussein to someone better and hundreds of millions of dollars were allocated to begin to organize Iraqi opposition groups, most of whom were living in exile in Britain and in France, because, you know, in Baghdad, Saddam would have killed them. They actually had intelligence people in Britain and France killing some of them, but enough of them survived to begin to organize an opposition movement. And that was done with President Clinton's okay. Now, I won't say enthusiastic okay. Clinton didn't really like the idea of regime change but by 1998-99, he was talking about his policy as containment plus, with a little vagueness about what plus meant. Containment plus, in my reading, was an affirmation that our official policy is still containment. We're not giving up on the strategy launched by Bush 1 at the end of the Gulf War and continued by Clinton through the decade. But we're also thinking that maybe it's time to begin exploring the alternatives. That's what the plus means. Uh, Clinton didn't ever approve regime change, but he was going to think about it as an option, if you will. Uh, that's a step away from containment or a step toward regime change. Not as much of an embrace as regime change as the neocons wanted, but I think it's important to realize that Clinton himself, a liberal Democrat, was also starting to move toward that idea. Now, of course, as the start of the new century, at the start of the new decade, everything changes. Uh, 2001 was a dramatic year in a couple of ways. Uh, what I call game changers. Number one was the election of George W. Bush. <clears throat> George Bush was a more conservative president and um, one who surrounded himself with neocon advisors. He didn't take office committed to regime change, but he had a lot of friends who believed in it, and he appointed those friends to key positions in his administration. Bush was also more resolute. Um, People who've written about him talk about how he tended to see the world in black and white with no nuance. It was good versus evil. It was us versus them. Seemingly, he would be more likely to be persuaded toward a dramatic new departure in American policy than Clinton, who was trying to play the margins and looking for the nuanced middle ground. Just a few months after Bush's inauguration, of course, were the famous 9-11 attacks, infamous 9-11 attacks in September of 2001. Uh, I think everyone in the room here looking around is old enough to remember, so I don't need to belabor what happened, nor do I need to remind you how terrified Americans were in the aftermath of that awful tragedy. Um, I do find it instructive to remind people it wasn't just the 9-11 assaults, but remember also the anthrax attacks against the federal government in late 2001, which um, aggravated and multiplied the level of fear, especially for people living in the East Coast. It seemed like all of a sudden the world was out to get us. There were enemies behind every bush. We didn't know where they were coming from. There was a tremendous amount of fear and among the people. All of you, I think, remember that. I've heard lots of people talk about it. I remember it myself. My thesis is that that fear also gripped the White House. It also gripped President Bush, and it led him toward a new policy orientation that was more militant, much different than it might have been had there not been these terrorist attacks in late 1991. Now that's not to say that Iraq was behind these terrorist attacks. Uh, the evidence that I've seen indicates Iraq was not behind these terrorist attacks, but the fear, irrationally, 
leads toward conclusions that might not be connected to the original source of the trouble. By early 2002, President Bush was making a case for war against Iraq, a case that was summarized as the Bush Doctrine. The Bush Doctrine essentially stated that the United States government was going to combat terrorism. It was also going to combat any state that sponsored terrorism. It was also not going to look favorably at any state that even said a nice word about anyone who would think might be a terrorist. Uh, it was a very doctrinaire statement that the U.S. was going to combat terrorism and its supporters and backers anywhere it found them. And if a government showed any sympathy toward the terrorist method of operation, that government would find itself in the crosshairs of the U.S. And the Bush Doctrine went on to say that the U.S. government reserved the right to engage in preemptive invasion of any state sponsoring, backing, or sympathizing with terrorists. With or without UN backing, with or without immediate provocation, if we think a state is supporting terrorists, we're now so concerned with terrorists, we're going to attack that state, even if we have to act on our own, without allies, without international sanction, without legal cause via the UN, and all of that stuff. That was a very dramatic change in American policy which Bush made in a series of speeches, beginning with the State of the Union message in 2002, extending through an address he gave at West Point in May of 2002, and then his Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense in a series of speeches across the summer. They very clearly laid out the case that they were contemplating, seriously, a war against Iraq. Uh, that war was launched in the early months of 2002. As the case was made, the American people, of course, so shell-shocked by 9-11 and the anthrax scares, they waved the president forward. Members of Congress did the same. The UN resolutions were passed that created at least a cloak of legal <laughs> sanction, and the war was begun on March 19th with the decapitation strike against Saddam Hussein, uh, who's believed to be at a place called Dora Farms, a little retreat on the outskirts of Baghdad. They opened the war by aiming for the top dropping several bombs on Dora Farms in hopes of assassinating Saddam at the outset. The Dora Farms operation didn't work. Saddam either has never, had never been there or had left several hours before the bombs arrived. But the war that followed was, relatively speaking, an easy operation. I talk here in strictly military terms on a tactical level. It took about 21 days or 500 hours. March 19th it began. By April 9th, the U.S. military and its British and Australian allies were in occupation of Baghdad. <clears throat> about 120,000 American soldiers, 20,000 Brits, and 500 Australians, uh, together with air superiority, they easily overran the Iraqi territory, they demolished the government, they scattered the army of 400,000 soldiers, they smashed its armor, it had the biggest armor fleet, um, second or third biggest in the world after the U.S., um, they smashed that within days. I mean, this is an overwhelming military victory. When President Bush stood on the ship deck off the coast of California and declared mission accomplished, and there was great celebration on strict military terms, it, indeed, it was a mission accomplished, and there was reason for American fighters to be very proud. They, they made quick work of uh, a seemingly vaunted adversary in no time at all, with the net cost of 139 dead American soldiers and 33 dead Brits. All tragedies, of course, but in the big picture, that's a very low casualty rate for an operation of this size. Now, um, in retrospect, and really in real time, uh, I think it's easy to identify that there were several crucial mistakes made by the U.S. government, by the Bush administration, during this dramatic military victory. Mistakes have come back to haunt the American people and the American government in short order. Number one, uh, there were insufficient troops sent into Iraq for purposes of the occupation that would follow a war. There were obviously enough troops sent for the conquest of Iraq. That was done uh, lickety split, so to speak. But for the occupation that would follow, the number was woefully inefficient, insufficient. And in fact, within days of the conquest of Baghdad, looting and rioting of major proportions took effect, took place because of the absence of any authority. The U.S. simply didn't have enough boots on the ground to provide basic law and order police presence. Second mistake, the Bush administration was woefully inadequate in failing to plan for the occupation. As the mount-up for war occurred, the State Department and the CIA and some military officers 
were going up to the White House saying, we have to talk about what follows the war, not just how but about what comes next. But the top brass in the administration seemed not to care about that. Uh, they thought, um, you know, what's the big deal? We'll take care of that. We're Americans. We'll figure it out. We're versatile. We're smart. We'll settle those problems when they confront us. They just didn't put enough planning into the post-war occupation. In my judgment, that was a mistake. Third step, they were ill-prepared to impose a regime of authority in Baghdad upon the fall of the Iraqi state, meaning that while they could have had some occupation authority ready to step in at a day's notice and declare authority, they had no such plan, and it took about six weeks of working through a variety of generals until they finally settled on something called the Coalition Provisional Authority under L. Paul Bremer. Um, and that six weeks was a huge window of time in which the chaos and the tumult and the insurgency all got underway. And then Paul Bremer, who became head of the Coalition Provisional Authority and who finally had the authority to say, I'm President Bush's guy, so I'm in charge. And that was a good thing to have someone in charge. Too bad it took six weeks for that to happen, but it did happen eventually. When he got to Baghdad, he made what I consider two uh, very important mistakes, very regrettable mistakes in his first two official acts as head of the CPA. CPA order number one, CPA order number two. Order number one was a declaration that anyone who had ever been a member of the Ba'ath Party, which was the leading political party of Iraq, Saddam Hussein Party, could not have any position in a post-war Iraqi government. Now, you might get rid of the top elite of the Ba'ath Party, maybe even two or three levels down, but then you get into sort of the technocratic base that runs the country, that knows how to operate the power plants and the universities and the hospitals and the water system, you kick them out and all of a sudden you have no one to govern the country. And that's exactly what happened. In other words, I think the surgical knife cut a little too deep. If I'd been in charge, I would have purged the top echelon, but then I would have relied on the technocrats at the working level to keep things uh, infrastructure-wise in order. Order number two came a few days later. That was the demolition of the entire government. Essentially, he said to every Iraqi who had a, a paycheck from the state, you're fired. Go home. We don't need you. We'll figure out something else. Again, that was a huge mistake, especially when it came to the military. Thousands of soldiers were turned loose without paychecks, without any chance of a stable future, but with their weapons. They went home <laughs> with their rifles, and they went home to sit without paychecks and to worry and to brood, and before long, they were forming the backbone of an anti-American insurgency. The third big mistake that Bremer made that hasn't gotten any fanfare, in fact, I'm going to break the story today, he started this uh, sartorial effort to mix business suits and combat boots, and it didn't work. It's <laughs> <laughs> actually his trademark. He went all over a rock wearing his combat boots with his business suit. I don't know if he's hoping it would catch on, but it didn't. Thank goodness. <laughs> Another mistake, the CPA uh, remained politically isolated. It stayed, because of the security situation, it had to stay in the green zone, meaning behind the security barriers in Baghdad. Its officials weren't out mixing up with the people, winning their hearts and minds or confidence. It was also bereft of all kinds of internal political issues, including some litmus tests. If you apply for a job at the CPA, you'd be asked questions like, what's your stance on abortion? Because we have to make sure that's right before we give you a job in Baghdad. Um, and so forth. There was also lots of corruption and waste of money and duplicate contracts and shoddy workmanship, inability to inspect what was being done, and so forth and so on. The typical stuff of government bureaucracy done in a hostile place miles from home. Well, it didn't take long for the uh, military victory, the rapid military victory, to turn into a dastardly prolonged insurgency and occupation that would last for many years. In short, I think the insurgency can be uh, dissected into three major strands. There was the old Sunni elite, meaning the Sunni minority Iraqis who had backed Saddam Hussein, upon whom Saddam Hussein had relied for all of his years in power. They simply continued fighting against the Americans as they had resisted the Americans before and during the war. And then there were Shiite militias, like uh, one organized, the so-called Mahdi Army, organized by Mutada al-Sadr, a fiery Shiite religious orator who was the leading henchman in a slum of two million Shiites on the outskirts of Baghdad. He raised a Shiite army to fight against the Sunnis and also to fight against the um, American occupiers, to try to drive them out and claim his place in the sun.
And then the third wave were non-Iraqi infiltrators, Al-Qaeda types, who flocked to Iraq from all over the region, enamored by a chance the bloody American soldiers and to take out some uh, Yankee imperialists. They came pouring into Iraq from around the world, uh, some of them notorious, many of them simply street fighters. And by the end of 2003 and certainly 2004, there was an insurgency that had swept the entire country. Car bombs, sniper fire, improvised explosive devices, targeted assassinations, just a, a huge wave of attacks. Um, IEDs, more than 100,000 by 2007. Dozens of suicide bombers putting on the vest and walking into a crowd and blowing themselves up. Here are some images that became prevalent in Western media by 2004 and 2005. Now, President Bush, to his credit, here I've been criticizing him, I'll give him some credit, he did muster the stamina to come up with kind of a take two, a second effort beginning in 2005, 2006, in my judgment. Uh, part one of his second effort was a campaign to democratize Iraq. When he invaded Iraq in 2003, he didn't talk about spreading democracy, he talked about combating terrorism, he talked about fighting weapons of mass destruction. Once the insurgency started, he found another cause, and that was the cause of promoting democracy in Iraq. And so he and his administration did work very hard at finding a way to build <coughs> democracy within the country. The CPA yielded authority as early as June 2004 to a transitional authority comprised of Iraqi leaders. Ayad Alawi was named interim prime minister at that time. So theoretically, even though the insurgency is a flame across the country and American GIs are there fighting, the Iraqi people are in control of this transitional authority. Then a series of democratic elections were held in 2005, first democratic elections in the history of the country. In January, the people went to the polls, hundreds of thousands turned out. Uh, this is a high watermark of the post-war experience. They elected a constitutional body that would write a new constitution for Iraq. That group wrote the constitution in early and mid-2005. And then in October, they had a national referendum to approve the constitution. It was approved. And then under the new constitution, they had another election in December to choose the first government, the first formal government, no longer transitional or interim, but now a formal permanent government under the new constitution. Nouri al-Maliki was named prime minister of a coalition government. Iraq had been divided among Shia, Sunnis, and Kurds. The new constitution provided for a power sharing among them. You'd have a prime minister of one ethnic uh, uh, group, a vice president of another, and then a president who is sort of a pro forma head of state representing the third group. And a coalition government balancing among these sectarian regimes did in fact develop by the end of 2005. Then to deal with the insurgency, the Bush team came up with a new strategy in 2007 called the surge. The surge was a, an effort to increase the American military presence and, importantly, many people don't realize this part of it, to change the tactics of fighting in a way to try to beat the insurgents at their own game. Step one was to increase the troop levels, and in fact about 40,000 new American soldiers were sent there, rising the troop level, raising the troop level from 120,000 to 160,000. Number two, the military units were told you've got to engage in new tactics. The old tactics were, you know, come in with a tank or an airplane and blow up a neighborhood in order to kill a known terrorist, but also you were killing lots of civilians. It was a callous kind of warfare. It cost the Americans unbelievable amounts of political prestige. The new tactics were be a kinder and gentler military occupier, if you will. Leave the big fortified bases outside of the cities, move the small outposts inside the cities, go on foot patrols with Iraqi units, smile at the local people, officers go have tea with the sheikhs, the tribal leaders of Iraqi society, have little town hall meetings where your officers hand, hand candy to children. This is all part of the calculated strategy of uh, ending collateral damage and of appearing to be a more friendly a more benign, a more benevolent kind of military force. And then the third technique was an effort to, quote, turn, unquote, adversaries. Turning adversaries meant using political influence and lots of money, largesse, to buy off your opponents and turn them into allies. One good example of that, 
Sunni militias uh, were approached and said, aren't you guys sick and tired of these Al-Qaeda types coming in from Jordan and Algeria and killing your people? Turns out the Sunni types were. Uh, they took pride in Iraq. They were regretful that Iraqi citizens were dying at the hands of foreign terrorists. What was called the Anbar Awakening in Anbar province of 2008 involved a series of Sunni militias turning their guns away from American troops and firing at the Al-Qaeda infiltrators with the support and backing and coordination of the American military. The Mahdi army of Muqtada al-Sadr was similarly turned, not to the same degree, but he at least sort of agreed to a ceasefire and he stopped shooting at the GIs as well. By 2008, the surge seemingly was winning the day. Greater troops, new tactics, turning adversaries into friends. It did appear by the end of 2008 that the insurgency was under control and that a, a platform of stability had been reached. That set the stage for the beginning of American withdrawal. President Bush agreed to the SOFA, that's, that stands for Status of Forces Agreements. That's an agreement that dictates how you govern troops within the, uh, within the territory of another country. The Status of Force Agreement of 2008 did set a deadline of December 31st, 2011 for the withdrawal of all American forces from Iraq. And I mentioned that was signed by President Bush in 2008. When Obama took office in early 2009, he declared that he was going to honor that agreement. And then, in fact, by August of 2010, he declared an end to combat operations, and he did withdraw the combat units, all combat units, from Iraq, uh, culminating on December 18th, about 13 months ago, honoring the agreement that President Bush had signed in 2008, and also, by the way, fulfilling one of his campaign pledges in 2008 that he was going to end the war in Iraq. That sets the uh, stage for the modern day, and I'm almost finished here. I'm going to make a couple of observations and open the floor to questions and comments. I'll open your insights about these issues as well. What are the contemporary challenges and prospects? Well, uh, one observation I would make is that the political situation in Iraq remains stable but dicey. There was a second wave of elections following the 2005 race in March of 2010. However, that election led to a prolonged deadlock. Um, it's, a constant, it's a parliamentary system, not like ours, but it's more like Israel or Britain, where there are a whole bunch of parties, and then once the election is held, the parties have to figure out coalitions to govern. Uh, I had Alawi's party won 91 seats out of 275 in the parliament. Uh, Amaliki's won 89 seats, a fewer number, but almost the same. And those two battled for months on who was going to form, who was going to lead the coalition government nine months of political deadlock, and many people predicted the country was going to come apart as it seems. But finally, in 2010, they reached a settlement where Maliki remained prime minister. Alawi was named head of a new national security council. They appointed a Sunni as vice president. They kept Jalal Talabani of Kurd on as uh, president, um, the figurehead president, and they seemingly escaped complete dismemberment, complete deterioration, and lived to sort of talk another day. Since then, however, there's been an ongoing Sunni-Shia political rivalry. In 2011, the uh, Shias in charge, meaning Maliki and Alawi, decided that the leading Sunni vice president had committed war crimes during the insurgency, and so they issued a warrant for his arrest. So he ran off to Kurdistan and hid for a while. Now he's run off to Turkey, where he's still in hiding. And then late last year, they dismissed the Sunni head of the Ministry of Finance under similar circumstances. And if you read the papers, in the last couple of months, there's been an uptick in violence in Baghdad, car bombs and suicide bombs. Uh, there was just a strike this week that killed 20. The death toll last week was 60. In the large realm of things, I mean, those are, again, everyone a human tragedy. In the large realm of things, those are fairly small numbers, but they've upticked since December of 2012. The country seems, according to some observers, on the edge of a wave of violence and maybe civil war again. What were the costs to the U.S.? This is a second observation I would make. Since the invasion of 2003 until the last combat forces left last year, there were 4,474 U.S. soldiers killed. Now notice the scale here, 139 <coughs> in the initial invasion, which says, Good job, guys. Mission accomplished. But look at the death toll that follows. That's an indication of how badly managed the occupation was. 100,000 or so Iraqi killed. We'll never know the exact number. Two million displaced by the war. 
30,000 U.S. soldiers wounded uh, because of the advances in medical care on the battlefield and so forth. The proportion of dead to wounded is more favorable, but of course now you have 30,000 or so U.S. soldiers, some of them with very grave wounds, uh, permanent um, wounds that they'll deal with the rest of their lives. More than a trillion dollars spent from the U.S. Treasury. Was it? I'm sorry? Was it? Was what? Was it from the National Treasury? Well, I, I thought it was the National budget. Treasury of China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was all budget, wasn't it? Well, there was still real money spent. I mean, there was real money going into paychecks and to pay the accounts from the defense contractors and so forth. But the final point is it provoked, in the judgment of some historians, myself included, the economic doldrums of the last 10 years. Um, it spiked interest, I'm sorry, it spiked a rise in the price of oil. It might have triggered the recession of 2008. And in fact, if you look at gross domestic product as a proportion of world gross domestic product from 2003 to 2010, the share of the world economy that we, the American people, have fell from 32% to 24%. That's the second worst fall off in the history of the world, surpassed only by the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, meaning that Iraq, uh, whatever good might come out of it, definitely came at cost, and someday we might look back um, and say that it was the beginning of the end of the American empire, I mean, hopefully not, but um, it was the beginning of the end of American prosperity, hopefully not, but maybe it might be a cause like that of some dramatic change. If I'm sounding a little iffy here, it's because I am. If I have any expertise to claim, I claim it about the past, I don't claim it about the future. Um, Let's meet again in 10 years or 20 years and have another discussion about how these things sort of sort out over time. And then I'll give you an answer that's maybe a little bit more definitive on the question of whether the American policy in Iraq of the last 10 years was wise or foolhardy and whether it was worth whatever comes out of it was worth the cost that the American people invested in it. I will pause there and welcome your questions and comments. Ma'am. So um, I lived. I returned to Baghdad in 1979. I lived through a lot of what you have been describing up until 94 when I left the country. Um, I just, I had some, uh, uh, Hassan Becker's choice of Saddam Hussein was not just for his ruthlessness. He belonged to the same decree right. plan. Right, that, that um, And then Saddam did, he, he had a role in the killing of uh, Ahmed Hassan and Becker's son-in-law. Um, it, was, it, was it was supposedly an accident, but the rumor had it then that it was engineered. And so slowly he started taking out members of his clan, or not him, and then eventually he edged him you know, out, to retirement. out of the way. Um, and then at the end of the uh, Iran-Iraq war, um, the, again, the, the sentiment was that the, these Gulf states that Saddam had been protecting um, owed him, he owed them money, right, because he had been borrowing from them. But the way he saw it was, you know, this is, in a sense, it's money for your protection, and that's, in a, in a sense, what instigated... Right. He wanted debt forgiveness. Um, the... the I, I have so many observations, it's just, I can't, like... Um, um, the, the, when the monarchy was, was kicked, was, um, well, basically, it was done away with, um, the, again, the thought was, it was with the end of the British Empire, the, inter the British interest in, those in that region was, in a sense, um, ceding to the power of American influence. So a lot of people consider Saddam uh, as, you know, their, their man in, mm -hmm. in the region. Um, my personal uh, hypotheses or reasoning, um, my father was ambassador of, of Iraq to a, 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 a number of countries prior to Saddam taking power. When he didn't become a Ba'athist, he was um, forced into retirement and 
temporarily under house arrest. Um, and at one point, he had in his possession, and we're talking in the 70s, under his personal name, personal account, over $2 million where he was funding liberation movements in Africa that were targeting all the old world colonies. In the Congo, in, 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 in South Africa, what used to be Rhodesia. Um, and so you would think, what, what is Iraq's interest in supporting these currents? It's, it's so far away, unless they, it was serving the interests of a higher power, at least that's mine. Well, thank you for your insights and reflections. Let me make a couple of comments. One, the point about the Tikritis. Tikrit is a town north of Baghdad. Uh, Iraq, historically and culturally, is based on tribe and family. The, the concept of a nation state is very much a Western concept <coughs> brought to the Middle East by the European empires. And over the course of the 20th century, Many local people bought into that concept and started identifying themselves as Iraqis. But there's an older and more powerful identity marker for the Iraqi people based on tribe and family. The Tikritis were people who came from the town of Tikrit, and they felt a common unity. I mean, it's, it's imperfect, but I think the best Western metaphor to invoke is sort of like a mafia, if you will. A mafia sounds criminal, and not all the tribes are criminal. A few of them were. But there was a sense of belonging to something uh, a club, a family-oriented club, the tribe. And um, Tikritis tended to stick together. They f knew each other. They were all you know, cousins nine times removed or whatever. And they, there was a sense of loyalty and reliability. And in fact, al Bakr was a Tikriti. He relied on Saddam as the uh, guest commented for exactly that reason. And then Saddam built his security apparatus on Tikritis as well. And uh, that that attraction or, or compulsion remains um, uh, far into the future. Thank you. In the back. Thank you for your presentation. I have just two questions. Uh, you talked about the role of the U.S. to help the Saddam against Iran during the war. Right. But my question is about the beginning of the war, the start of the war, uh, especially regarding to the capture of American embassy in Tehran. They believe that that was the point that U.S. pushed Saddam to toward to beginning the war against Iran. Right. This was the question. Okay. Uh, as we know, as the historian, no history could be alive for future. The same issues uh, that uh, there was about the Saddam and Iraq at that time, including nuclear plan, sanction, and military action, it seems that they are now about Iran on the, on the table. As a, what is your achievement, your advice, according to this historical process, for uh, politicians about Iran? Okay, thank you. Two very important questions. Uh, the first one strikes me as pretty easy for me to answer. The second one, a little more difficult, so let me go to the easy one first. When Iraq invaded Iran in September 1980, it was alleged by the Iranian government at the time, and it is, the charge has been repeated by scholars and other commentators since, that the United States pushed the Iraqis to launch that attack. But this was an indirect offensive by the U.S., to try to take out Khomeini and um, free the hostages and bloody the you know Iranians we hated and so forth. Uh, my personal professional judgment is I don't buy it. It's an interesting conspiracy theory. I've looked at the evidence and I don't see any compelling evidence that persuades me that it's true. It's plausible, but I don't believe it's true. Uh, and there's counter evidence against it. Um, counter evidence, for instance, Jimmy Carter, when he wrote his memoirs, he admitted to a lot of mistakes, and he revealed a lot of things that had once been secret. On that question, he adamantly said, it's ridiculous, we never would have done such a thing, and so forth. Now, maybe he lied in his memoirs, but he told the truth through so much of the rest of his memoirs. He has a certain amount of credibility on, on that score. Point two, the onset, the very first and most important objective of Jimmy Carter in late 1980 was figuring out a way to get the hostages out of Iran. 
Uh, in fact, his political livelihood was based on his ability to do that. The election of 1980 was going to turn on whether the hostages were still in captivity or not. He was working furiously to find a diplomatic means to get them out. The onset of the war complicated that diplomacy and, in fact, delayed a settlement until after the election, to the point where he had like meetings scheduled with Iranian emissaries to talk about how to release the hostages. And when the war started, they couldn't hold the meetings because of the chaos of war and, you know, the Iranians were busy and so forth. So that was a huge setback for Jimmy Carter. And thus, I think he would not have tried to instigate that war. Starting that war was not going to get him reelected. Uh, preventing that war and getting the hostages out would have gotten him reelected. He had every reason to try to um, end the hostage crisis. And so, again, it's a plausible thesis, but I personally speaking don't buy it. The second question about what to do with Iran today, you're right that there are parallels. Um, there were great fears of Iraq having weapons of mass destruction. Uh, there was the tactic of um, financial sanction, financial sanctions against Iraq to try to modify its behavior. The same kind of situation pertains today in Iran. This is the difficult answer because, again, we're asking us to uh, provide conjecture about the future. My feeling is that even I, I see the temptation among some to launch a military action of some kind against Iran to deal with Iran as Iraq was dealt with. Personally speaking, I think that would be a bad idea at the present moment. Um, not that the current situation is tolerable or completely free of problems or risks, but I think the risks of escalating to military action are much greater than the risks of not doing so. I still have some faith that there's a diplomatic settlement that might restore stability in the region, preserve stability in the region without uh, the need for military force. Now, that's coming from the same person who said on record in 2003 that I didn't think a war against Iraq was necessary, and who writes in the book that I didn't think the war was necessary, um, even though the outcome could, as you heard me say this morning, in the long term, with great costs, could turn out okay. In the real time of 2003, I thought the diplomacy could continue to work. In the real time of 2013, I think the same thing with regard to Iran. Question? I've heard done. Richard Clark say that Iran won the Iraq war, that they controlled the oil, and that the Iraqi oil, that is, that it's marketed through Iranians, that um, um, the leadership in Iran, the Shiite leadership at least, has their families in Iran. Um, and I just wondered what your thought was. Also, I just observed that there are economists who say that that one trillion is the short term cost, the long term cost is yes. much higher, maybe three trillion. Um, and I just wonder what you, what you thought about Richard Clark's observations. Well, yeah, the costs here, uh, the, the, the U.S. costs, as you can see, are indeed dramatic. The trillion spent is money already spent, but when you care for 30,000 disabled veterans for the rest of their lifetimes and pay off debt and interest on the debt and so forth, the costs will indeed go up. Iran did okay in the uh, local context of the Iran-Iraq war. Iran is a Shiite government, does have Shiites in control of Iraq. It has gained financially, it has spread its intelligence apparatus. Uh, for a while, it fueled a lot of the insurgency, but that foreign insurgency has now been defeated. Um, and I think I'm skeptical of Clark's argument because I think as time goes by, it will be clear that the Iraqis are going to rally around the idea of an Iraqi nation, and they're going to be resistant to intrigue coming from Iran. Um, Saddam Hussein in 1980 calculated that he was going to find allies within Iran who hated Khomeini so much they would come to his side, but the Iranians rallied, circled the wagons and proved their nationalism. I think Iraqis will do the same. Um, and there is historic mistrust and bitterness between those two countries. And so I think as time goes by, it's likely that the apparent Iranian influence is going to wane and that Clark's thesis will prove to have limits. Actually, two questions. Um, one, what's your opinion about Baker's policy of keeping Saddam in a cage for the last 10 years, from 03 to today? Would that still have worked? And secondly, what has Bremer said about what are seemingly such terrible decisions that he made um, upon his appointment to the CPA? On the first question, I think, had there been a diplomatic renaissance and recommitment to the containment policy, it could have worked indefinitely. Now, uh, that statement is contingent on allies like the French and 
potential adversaries like the Russians and Chinese being persuaded. And so I recognize maybe that was impossible, and maybe the containment regime was going to break down. Uh, but I think had it been rejuvenated in some way, and had it been modified in certain key ways, it could have lasted. We're talking counterfactuals. We don't know what would have happened had we taken the other road in 2003. But at the time, my thinking was we should stay on the containment road. And in retrospect, I continue to believe there's enough viability there that one could argue that that was a viable option that could have been uh, could have been attempted over the long term. Um, your second question? Bremer. What Bremer, is the same decisions? Yeah, he hasn't made, as far as I know, a retrospective uh, defense of them. At the time, he said, depacification was crucial because the ideology of the Bach party was so extreme that um, anyone tainted by it would be unworkable. And that we had sufficient reserves of Iraqi opponents we were going to bring in from overseas to make it work. Now, that proved to be untrue, but that was the defense he made. One of his assistants said famously with regard to the second order, we don't, his quotation was something very close to this, if not exactly this, we don't pay armies we've just defeated. Um, and to me, that the context in which it was said suggested an era of hubris, I mean, arrogance, you know, that we beat up these guys, we're in control, don't tell us what to do. We're Americans, we have a can-do spirit, we're going to figure it out. We don't need to bring in these Iraqis who were, you know, our enemies two days ago and, and try to rely on them to police the state. We can figure out how to make it work. Secretary of State Rumsfeld was thinking strategically about a new security doctrine worldwide of, of cutting the American military by a third or a half and relying on high tech and fast mobility and things like that. And so he thought of it in terms of, you know, we can pull this off and we don't need... Uh, to put a lot of these people on our payroll, we don't need to have higher numbers of American soldiers. That was their, the, the mentality of their thinking at the time. Sir? Two things. Uh, in your opinion, I remember when George H.W. Bush cited the reason for not moving on, he talked about the UN resolutions just for freeing Kuwait and uh, whether he could keep a coalition together through the UN to, to carry on to Baghdad. Had they gone on and overthrown Saddam then, do you think that the outcome would have been different than what it was 10 plus years later, uh, uh, as far as you know, giving Saddam 10 more years to consolidate his power. And number two, uh, I mean, I concur with what you said that it seems like they didn't plan. They won the war, but didn't plan very well for winning the peace. And had they in advance identified factions or people who could they, they could put in place quickly to assume power? Iraqis. I think they wanted to avoid an appearance of an occupying <coughs> army, but. Had they really spent much time identifying allies that could run the country? Yeah, I, I, uh, two great questions. On the first one, I think had the march to Baghdad happened in 1991 instead of 2003, it could have potentially been more costly on the ground because the um, in the decade that interceded, the Americans came up with a number of high-tech weapon systems that enabled them to deliver firepower more precisely and with less risk to humans. That would have been the case in 1991. Uh, the political cost couldn't have been any worse in 1991. I mean, in 2003, you know, most of the world thought, what's this mad Texan cowboy doing? Um, American prestige was sapped all over the place. So I can't imagine in 1991 that element of it would have been any worse. The definitive question is what would have followed? And one of the reasons why Bush hesitated, Bush one hesitated in 91 was that there was no viable, clearly viable alternative to Saddam Hussein. He'd been so brutally killed or driven away, any potential replacement. And part of the calculation was, we get rid of Saddam, and there's really, you know, as Kono Powell put it, if you, if you break it, you bought it. Now you're in charge, and who are you going to rely on, and what a mess that would be. Um, that's what Bush too found in 2003. His father, had he tried it in one, I think, would have found the same thing. And we could have seen just as messy an occupation insurgency in 91, 92, as we saw in 2003 and 2004 as a result. I'm good at forgetting second questions. Remind me of your second one. It just seemed like the attitude of the U.S. when they went in in 2003 was that they'd be welcome with open arms oh, right. once they defeated Saddam. And, right. uh, I mean, if you look at what happened in Yuga, former Yugoslavia once you had a power vacuum in the USSR and East Germany, I mean, there's a lot of instability. They yes. seem to plan for that. That's true. They, to a certain degree, they were duped or misled by 
the Iraqi expatriates with whom they met. They were meeting with the Iraqis who fled Iraq to get away from Saddam in London and Paris and elsewhere. Um, many of them gave very rosy scenarios of what would greet the GIs when they came to Baghdad. Um, those rosy the scenarios weren't quite so rosy in reality, but Americans were sort of misled into false expectations, overly optimistic expectations of what they would find. They also tried to rely on some of those expats to be the backbone of the new government, most famously a guy named Ahmad Shalabi, who um, was based in London since the 1980s or something like that. He survived several assassination attempts by uh, Saddam's henchmen, thugs sent to get him. By the way, Al-Maliki and Alawi, the same thing, 20 or 30 years in exile, constantly on guard because Saddam was gunning for them, even in Western Europe and so forth. Shalabi turned out to be criminal and corrupt, and the Americans eventually cashiered him. In fact, his, head, his office was raided and he was put in jail for a while. But for a while, he was the darling of the Bush administration. In fact, when Bush gave his State of the Union message in 2002 or 2003, Shalabi was given the seat of honor next to um, his wife in the gallery there, you know, where the TV cameras like to pan. He was like seen as the George Washington. In fact, there was one neocon in the Bush White House who called him the George Washington of Iraq. They had these high hopes that he was going to be the guy all the Iraqi people would rally around. But the reality was he'd been living overseas for 25 years. He was corrupt. He had no following among the, uh, the people in the street, quote-unquote street of Iraq. And the initial effort to base something on him just slipped through their fingers. And in the meantime, they lost months of uh, planning and were behind the eight ball as a result. So again, more careful planning, more calculated thinking, better intelligence, a deeper appreciation for Iraqi culture, uh, listening to the State Department and CIA saying, be careful, this is a quagmire, take it slow, let's think about what's going to follow the occupation. Those are all mistakes made. Um, and it's hard to sort of excuse them or, or you know, talk around them. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia. I've always been confused about what is their role. I mean, the Saudis are very quiet, but are they pulling strings behind the scenes? Because it seems to me that the, uh, what was the, those councils called, the alliance councils, the Sunni, what, what were they called, do you remember? I, I'm not sure what you're referring to. I'm referring to a, a number of councils that were set up among Sunnis uh, to help with the surge. And I've always wondered what the... Council? I'm sorry? The Gulf states, like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, no, the Gulf state it's council. The alliance, it's the alliance. Yeah, the, the, the Gulf state alliance council. Um, I'm not sure we're talking about exactly the same thing, but my question has to do with Saudis. Okay. Are they bankrolling this? Mm -hmm. What is their role? Are they really as passive as they look, or are they manipulating things behind the scenes? Uh, I don't know, actually, the extent of their involvement. They do seem to be passive. They uh, also have a lot of money, and they're known to spend money in surreptitious ways. They certainly were quiet backers of the American effort to remake Iraq and to keep Iran at bay. Uh, they have fabulous wealth, and they're willing to spend it. They have political influence that they're willing to exert. But I actually don't know the fine angles of Saudi involvement. Because there is a speculation, and that's all it is, is speculation, that one of the long-term impacts of uh, the Iraq war was the Saudis woke up and started to realize that they were going to have to play a more active role. And that there will be, over time, and this is a real speculation, a feeling of uh, rapprochement uh, between Israel and Saudi Arabia because suddenly their interests in the regions are starting to converge. It's a pure speculation. You want to comment on that? Or? The, the Saudis have been among the more benign of the Arab states vis-a-vis -vis Israel. They have had a rapprochement since the 1990s. <laughs> They've been talking and cooperating in certain political and international trade aspects. One of the old rules of thumb in Middle East diplomacy is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so I would not discount the possibility that if Iran should emerge as a mutual adversary, that the Saudis and the Israelis might um, do what it takes to sit side by side and plan cooperatively. Time for one more question. Yeah, can you take one more and then we'll, yeah. we can pick them. Sure, one more. Yeah, you know, we didn't carbon bomb, we had smart bombs. So how did, were that 100,000 Iraqis killed them? 
uh, a lot of them were, were dead from sectarian, intersectarian violence. They were the ones who died when the suicide bomber pulls the string and kills 25 people in the marketplace. Uh, I, I don't know the breakdown between the number killed by American uh, combat action and the, the number who were simply caught in the crossfires. And the number 100,000 is widely contested. There are some estimates of as many as a quarter of a million. There are some of like 50 to 60,000. I've made an educated guess at all based on reading various accounts and how they made their uh, calculations that about 100,000 seems to be emerging as a consensus. Uh, but it could have been significantly higher, given simply the, you know, the chaos and tumult of that society and the absence of clear records and so forth. It's very hard to know the exact number. But um, probably a majority of them died at the hands of other Iraqis or the infiltrating insurgents. Before I close, I want to give you a quiz. I understand you're with the quiz, so you got to have to take a piece of paper. It's a one-question quiz, and I thought an Ohio State alumni group would like it. The uh, graphic editor who designed the cover for Oxford University Press embedded the image of a buckeye on the cover of my book. I want to see if anybody can find this. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. One final thought. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Peter's talk was as much about uh, current events uh, as, as much a, uh, as it was about history. And I just draw to your attention a publication uh, we produce out of the History Department, an online publication called Origins: Current Events in Historical Perspective. If you go to origins.osu.edu, you get free access to our, to our monthly magazine. The, the topic this month, I'm going to forget it, the topic this month is uh, when, uh, when 65 became old, sort of the history of aging <laughs> in America, and maybe for the boomers in the audience, uh, that might call it. 65 became young. <laughs> <laughs> 65 is the new 45, right? Exactly. Uh, thank you again, Peter. Uh, we have the room till 12 if we want to have, uh, say, have a conversation. Otherwise, uh, there's uh, food and drink uh, downstairs, of course. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, know, uh, you had a lot of good questions. If I had uh, if I had asked.